Open your Bible, if you would, to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7 is where we'll begin in just a moment. What a blessing to be here together. Amen? Amen. Just being able to worship with my family here at Fairmont Park and to live out our lives together is just, just moving. Yesterday, we had a real church wedding. Both sides, the bride and the groom, grew up in this very congregation, and we got to celebrate that and to see that with their two families. As far as family community goes, we're going to be able to celebrate a man who served in ministry for 50 years. And this Sunday marks the first official Sunday of service for our son-in-law, Laredo Shannon. He's a student at the Sunset School of Preaching, and he had to have an internship over the summer, and he foolishly agreed to be our intern. <laughs> Yeah, I'm excited about that this summer. Jesus, in conclusion to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, calls us to action. He has talked about the very nature of what it means to be in the kingdom. He began with the Beatitudes that describe the, the very DNA of what it means to be in the place where God reigns. So we talked about how he redefines righteousness, calls it real righteousness, an internal righteousness, an authentic one that's about who you are, not just what you do. And real relationships and, and real worship, real peace. But then he comes to chapter 7 and say that we've got to make a real choice. Now we will make the choice whether we actively think we are or not because essentially we will choose to follow him or any other decision is to choose to reject him. When I was growing up, the most well-known scripture, if you went to a baseball game or if it was televised and somebody held up a postcard that would have a scripture on it, what was it? John 3.16. That was the scripture. That was the verse. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Son of God would have life. And now I can't even quote it in front of you. That's amazing. That was 1 John 5. You know, I'm just going to read John 3.16. Wow. Well, it's a really well-known verse for most people. <laughs> for God so loved the world. That's the one I was thinking of. That He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believed in Him would not perish, but have eternal life. Nowadays, though, John 3.16 is not the most commonly quoted verse. It's been surpassed. One that's more common is found right here in John 7, verse 1. Do not judge. That's usually where it ends. Of course, the rest of the verse is, so that you will not be judged. I've seen this one in postcards and sporting events. I've seen this one televised, and I've seen it quoted numerous, numerous times. And the idea seems to be in its application. Brother Steve, if you're back there, could you close those doors for me? I'll give you the license plate of the person that parked in a way that blinds me this morning. But it's quoted in a way to say, you can't judge. As soon as somebody says, hey, I don't, I don't know if that's right. I don't know if you should be doing that. Oh, no, no, the Bible says that you can't judge. First time I heard that quoted on television, years ago even, is there was a, a small community in South Texas, and there was a, they use the term gentleman's club, which is an interesting stretch of the words. But they were going to put a gentleman's club in. This is a family-friendly sermon, so we'll leave it at that. And, of course, it caused an uproar, and there were people saying, we don't want that kind of business here. And so some folks decided they would just stake out, and they would take pictures of everybody's license plate that parked there. Well, there were some other businesses in that area, so what happened, of course, no one would go near that area, and it was hurting other businesses, got on the news and all of that. So finally, the news got a camera, and they interviewed uh, one of the ladies there. And they said, what do you think about all this? And she said, never forget it, she said, all these Christians are hypocrites. Because after all, the Bible says, don't judge. In a culture that worships tolerance today, this is a great verse. But is that what Jesus meant? So we get all convoluted, we get all tied up and tangled up over, well, what do we judge, who do we judge, uh, how do we judge, and all that sort of stuff, when that's not at all what Jesus is saying. 
Because the word that he uses is not to recognize whether something's right or not, but the word judge means to determine. Even today when, when there's some sort of court case going on and the different lawyers are trying to present things, it's the judge who might say, no, you can't say that, or strike that from the record, or this evidence isn't permissible in court. For it's the judge who determines whether something is appropriate to bring under scrutiny. So Jesus starts by saying, don't you be doing that. Why is it that I can't determine the true value of someone. Let me, try it, let me try it this way. Have you ever had a small child in your home? Anybody? Okay, a few of you. Have you ever had a small child do something that you would rather they not have done? Anybody? Okay. And so when you say to them, do you say to them, you have done a bad thing? Or do you say to them, you are a bad boy? You can hear the difference, can't you? One is to bring judgment to an action. You've done something wrong versus to bring judgment to the person. You're a bad person. You're a bad boy. Or you're a bad girl. That's a statement about who they are, not just about what they may have done. And that we're prohibited to do. Have you ever in your life, in your spiritual growth, have you ever had an off time? Have you ever had an out of season? Have you ever had a period in your life when you weren't living close to Christ? What if someone would look at you right then and there and say, you're not being a good Christian, you're out of here. And that might even have been accurate at that moment, right? In that moment, perhaps you weren't living like you should. But what if someone is going to come back to Christ five years from now? See, I don't know that. I don't know where they are. I don't know what all the issues are. So Jesus says, do not judge lest you be judged. And then he gives us an example, he says, for you will be judged the same way. Verse 3, why do you look at a speck that is in your brother's eye, but don't notice the log that is in your own eye? The problem we have is that we cannot judge fairly. Are you more likely to be harsh with someone that you like or with someone you never really liked anyway? Are you likely to let your friend skate a little bit, but a stranger you might want to prosecute to the full extent of the law? Is it easy for you to forgive someone else or to forgive yourself? The point of all that is, we are not just in our judgment that we tend to be swayed by, well, you know, they're a good person, they just had a bad day, versus that's just the way they are. See, there's proof. It may be the same action. He says that we need to look at our own lives. He calls us hypocrites when we spend our time trying to judge others when we won't look at our own lives. But if Jesus' intention is to talk about how we weigh out the grains of sand in one another's lives, listen to what he does next. Because here's a strange little paragraph right in the middle of this judgment conversation. He says, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks find, and to him who knocks it will be opened. What does that have to do with judgment? If this is about how to lean back and spot the good from the bad folks, what's this? There's a promise here, an assurance that Jesus says that if you search for God, if you pursue him, you will find him. It's a promise. In fact, he'll go on to say, now listen, don't you, in verse 9, or what man is there among you when his son asks for a loaf, will he give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, will he give him a snake? If you being evil, he says, as flawed as we are as parents, don't we know how to give good things to our children? If we can do that, as flawed as we are, how good would, would God be at that? So what are we talking about? Jesus is calling us to make a choice. Jesus has no need to judge us because he said the world has already been judged in John 5. I didn't come to judge the world, it's judged already. The world's already lost before Jesus ever came. Lost. So that doesn't need to be taken care of. That's already our condition. So Jesus comes to offer salvation. But will we choose that particular road? 
There's one thing that God wants. He wants it more than anything else. A God who is so powerful, who can speak the world into existence, whose love is so limitless that he can forgive us when we call upon him. The one thing that God wants with all of his power, he cannot force. He can only ask. What he wants is that we would love him like he loves us. You can't force that. You can't make that happen. If he were to grab us and shove us through that, down that particular path, now we're robots. He wants us to choose him. So he invites. He promises that if we will seek him, he will not be hard to find. God has gone to way too much trouble. He has given his son on the cross for us to be difficult now. So Jesus says, if you ask, he'll answer. If you seek, you'll find. If you'll knock, he's going to open the door. And what will you find behind that door? Your father's embrace. For he told the story of the prodigal father that, that wept with joy when his stinky son ran into his embrace. And he said, my son, who is dead, is alive. He was lost. He's found. That's what you'll find. And in so doing, we learn a principle in verse 12. Because if we're going to follow God, if we're going to pursue Him, then it changes the way we treat each other. He says that we will treat one another as we would want to be treated, for this is the law and the prophets. It's always been simply two things. Will you love God and will you love one another? That's all there is. Anything other than that isn't real. You can come up with rules and you can do weird things, And you can say it's in the name of God, but if we don't love God and we don't love one another, then it isn't real. Or at least it isn't satisfying to God. Listen to the heart of Jesus in verse 13 when he says, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. There was a time when I heard Jesus' tone of voice as a threat. You better or else. I've come to realize that this is Jesus imploring us. This is Him inviting us. This is Jesus standing watching the herd of humanity plunge off the cliff. And He's calling us, choose the other path. Choose the other door. Because He could just grab us and drop kick us down that path. There's another one you got to choose. So he invites, and he invites, and he invites. So he says the truth, that there's a choice here, and one leads to salvation, the other leads to destruction. That's why we got to choose. It's so important that Jesus came all the way from heaven and gave his life so that he could invite us to follow him. In verse 15, there's an enemy. There's a liar, a deceiver, who somehow in his own pride and arrogance thought that he could, I don't know, be in charge, and God cast him out of heaven because there's only one God. Satan is thoroughly defeated, but there's an evilness to his heart. Even though he's defeated, you can't dethrone God. He wants to bring pain and misery to the heart of God. And the best way it would seem that Satan has left is to hurt God's children. That nothing would hurt the heart of God more than to separate his children from him. Those of us who are parents can easily imagine that. So he lies. Jesus says there's only two paths, there's only two choices, there's only two gates. And Satan comes along and says, well, now... The truth is, a long time ago, God said you can eat any of, the trees, uh, any of the fruit of the trees you want to, just not the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can have everything else, just not this. Because if you eat of it, you'll die. And Satan shows up and says, well... And he lied. 
He didn't grab Eve. He didn't grab Adam by the back of the head and take that, that apple or that raisin or whatever ugly thing it was and, and, and shove it down their throat and make them swallow. Look, now you're sinners. Ha! Well, no, that's not what sin is. Sin is relational. It is a betrayal in the relationship. When you're in your marriage or you're in your friendship and, and someone you're in a relationship with lies to you or does something wrong, the reason why it's a problem is because it damages the relationship and it hurts. So Satan's not going to make us do anything. He's going to say, well, now God said that, but you won't really die here. Wouldn't you rather do this instead of listen to him? That's why when you crunch into the fruit that God's heart is broken. Because you just said, I don't care about you. Sin is the damage that we do in our relationship with God and to one another. So Jesus says, beware of the false prophets. Because Satan has all kinds of messengers whose purpose is to deceive, to rob us from our relationship with God. He tempts us all the time. Here's something better than God. Here's something better than a relationship with God. Oh, yeah, yeah, God says he loves you, but let me show you what's really great. And over and over and over, we stomp on the heart of God by saying, I see your love, I see your sacrifice, but you're not enough for me. Husbands, my brothers, if your wives looked at you and said, you're just not enough for me and walked out, how would that feel? My sisters, ladies, if your husband looked at you and said, you know, you're just not enough. That's what we say to God. God has created us. God has provided for us. God has redeemed us. God has loved us. God walks with us. God dwells within us. And Satan whispers, you need someone else. All throughout the scriptures, God uses the term spiritual adultery to illustrate the pain that we bring to him and to one another. Jesus, beware of the false prophets, people who claim to speak for God, that are being driven not by God but by Satan. They carry a message of destruction, not of salvation. They come to you in sheep's clothing. It wouldn't be tempting if it wasn't good to look at. If I were to go on a diet, I'm not saying that I need to, but if I were to, what was that? Anything you feel like you need to add? He's good. <laughs> if I were to go on a diet and you were to come by me with one of those, um, uh, what are those called? My dad likes them every holiday season. Those mice meat pies, they take little pieces of mice and they grind them up and they put it together. <laughs> Is that my, my mince meat pie? Same thing. It's, it's, it's got all these yucky, nasty raisins in it. It's just chock full of raisins. And now, to this day, if I smell cinnamon, I get nervous. Because usually, if there's cinnamon, there's some yucky raisins involved. And you know that, that raisins are grape zombies. <laughs> Can I get an amen? Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. I mean, I don't even think cockroaches eat raisins. You know what I'm saying? So I look, if, if you brought one of those mince meat pies by me and you said, ooh, look, dessert, ooh, I'd be like, no, thank you. And you'd be so impressed. You'd be like, wow, Mike, he's got such strength of character, such self-control. I was hoping the sermon would get better here in a minute. <laughs> you got such self-control, you're just really amazing. And I'd say, yeah, I know. That's because I don't like raisins. There is no temptation whatsoever. But now, if you brought by one of those multi-layer German chocolate cakes, I'd be like, what diet? That starts tomorrow. <laughs> right? Because temptation means, ooh, that really, that seems good. That, that seems like a good idea. And that's exactly what false prophets are dressed in sheep's clothing because it seems like a good idea. It seems like what I need. It's a lie. It's deceit. And I say, this is what I need to do to be happy. This will fulfill me. This is all I need. And we walk away from God because he's not enough. Inwardly, though, he says they're ravenous wolves because the intent is to destroy. See, Satan says, come over here, I'll make you happy. Come over here, I'll make your life full. And you turn away from God and you get in the middle of raisin pie. And then when you are hurting and when you are 
when you are, are cut into a million pieces, when, when, when everything starts to fall around you, and you say, oh no, you know what Satan does? Because <laughs> that's why he started it. He's like a hungry wolf who desires to destroy. He says in verse 16, So you'll know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit. The best way to know you have an apple tree is if it has apples hanging on it. So if we're really going to follow Jesus, it ought to make a difference. doesn't mean we'll be perfect. But if you're really going to follow Jesus, something ought to change. Perhaps before we got married, we might have gone out with the guys or the gals, depending, and we might have played basketball, or we might have played video games, or we might have done this, that, or the other. But when you get married, something changes, doesn't it? In fact, if it doesn't, somebody has to say, um, you know, you're married now, right? Because you have a, a new priority. You have a, a new covenant. And so Jesus says, you'll know this by the fruit. Not, we're not talking about perfection, so we're not talking about the, judging the value of people. We're talking about being fruit inspectors. You ought to be able to recognize an apple versus a banana. One's this, one's the other. You ought to be able to recognize the presence of Christ in our lives. Because he says a good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruits cut down and thrown into the fire. Jesus is not threatening, he's begging. Because if we don't choose him, he knows exactly what's going to happen. He's standing as we start toward the falls, and he's crying out, come over here, come over here, because he can't make us come. The outcome is certain without Christ. There's no question, there's no doubt we are going over the falls into the abyss of hell. That's not a warm, fuzzy statement, but it's true. And that's why Jesus says it. How much would God love us if he knew our destruction was coming and he didn't want to say anything about it? See? But it's not with a shaking finger. It's not a threat. It's an appeal. Choose. Please choose me, Jesus would say. Because there's a way that leads to death, a way that leads to destruction. In verse 21, as he speaks to this audience of people who for generations have served him, who have for generations have worshipped God, and they've come to the temple and they've offered the sacrifices and done all that stuff, these Jews, and he says something really important. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but it's he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. This is where I would cut the line between having a religion and having a relationship. Because you can say things and you can do things and you can, and you can, and you can take communion and you can put money in the, in the offering and you can listen through uh, an amazing sermon like this one. You can do all that stuff, and that's not the same thing as choosing to follow Jesus. If you choose to follow Jesus, then you're going to do these things. Did you follow that? That's righteousness all over again from way back in chapter 5. So just saying it, just showing up, that, that's not, it's not about religion. It's not about just a new version of a new set of rules and trading a temple for a church building. It's about Jesus. Choosing Him. In fact, he says in verse 22, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? What's wrong with that? Isn't that good stuff? Wouldn't you say, wow, that's a great ministry you got going there. Boy, you're really involved in a wonderful ministry. Look at all the lives you're touching. That'd be true. Is it possible to serve others and be lost? Is it possible to do good and still be lost? Why, sure. There's, there's motorcycle gang members that do really good things who don't ever name Jesus' name. Well, not in this context anyway. So the doing of these good things, that itself is not the issue or the focus. In fact, he says, and then I will declare, declare to them, I never knew you. We've never known each other. 
Yeah, but I've been doing all this stuff in your name. That's not the same thing as following Jesus. Following Jesus should lead us to serve in righteous things, but doing righteous things isn't necessarily the same as following Jesus. So Paul would say, you can do all these things, but if you don't have love, it means nothing. There are two things we're supposed to do, love God and love each other. Otherwise, it's some convoluted, weird weekend religious thing rather than following Jesus. Now why? Why is he saying this? Because see, this is his conclusion. He's just about to say, stand and sing in two more paragraphs. He's almost done teaching. So this is at the end of it. There's a call. And there's one last appeal, one last image, one last picture. Because he's talking to people who claim to love God. He's talking to people who've been religious for generations. He's not talking to the pagan here. He's not talking to the atheist here. He's talking about people who regularly offer sacrifices at the temple and worship to God. So he has one more picture in his final appeal. Therefore, Summarizing three chapters of solid red. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The storms come, the rains come, the floods rise, and he says the house stands because it's founded on the rock. In contrast, there's those who hear his word and don't act on them. So they know the word, they hear the word, they do stuff, but they're not doing anything with this word. He's talking to religious people. If it doesn't come all the way down to how I live, if it doesn't bear any fruit, if it doesn't change how I live, then what's the point of all this? He says they're like somebody that builds their house on the sand. Pretty view, maybe, unless it's the sand and like La Mesa. But they build their house on the sand, and then what happens? The storm comes, the, 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 the floods come, and the house falls, he says, and the collapse is great. Why is Jesus saying this? In this message, it's his final appeal to say, choose me. You've got to hear my words, and then you've got to do something with it. It's got to be real to you that it changes how you live because it's changed who you are. If it's just, yeah, that's a good idea, that's not real. But if it's a, you know... I'm going to follow him. What does that look like? It means looking into his word, following his word, and living out his word. The final appeal is, please choose this, because if you don't, everything else we do, all of our insurances and all of our investments and, and all of our retirement plans, all of our dreams, all of our accomplishments, all of our possessions, all of our memories, all of our trips, there's a time coming, brothers and sisters, friends and visitors. And I want to say this not as a threat, but as an appeal. There's a time coming when your life will end. And then what? If your house is built on the sand, then no matter what your life was, no matter what your accomplishments, no matter what your insurances, no matter what your investments, you are going to stand before the Creator, the living God, and be deficient. I do not like at all. If I could take out an eraser and erase it out of my Bible, I would do it in a heartbeat. The last verse of Matthew 25, he says to those that were on his left, Go away, you accursed ones, into the eternal fire. I wish that wasn't in there. That would really suit me if that wasn't in there. But Jesus says it over and over and over. Listen, if it wasn't so urgent, why would he come in the first place? Why wouldn't Jesus just give a few suggestions and hope for the best? There's a desperate plea because there's an eternity that matters. If you will choose him, if you will hear his words and act on them, live out the truth that he gives us. He says, you build your house on the rock and it survives the storms of this life and the storm of the end of life. 
For we'll all stand before the judgment seat of God. Some, he will say, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire. But to others, he will say, enter into the joy of your master's presence. Well done, my good and faithful servant. And that's going to be phenomenally fantastic. Where John struggles to say there's no sorrow, there's no tears, there's no sickness. God is love and it is just that. It's just being in perfectly unblemished love. That's why Jesus is pleading. For the life we have now, I've come that may have life and have it abundantly, Jesus said. A life that can stay stable in the storms of life. But there is an eternity. It does make a difference. So this morning, I don't want to shake my finger, but I want to invite you to Jesus. Invite you to make a choice to follow Him. Because it matters. And it matters forever. And so if we can help you in any way to follow Jesus, whether that's you're ready to be baptized into Christ, just before we got to witness a new family and a marriage, our brother Don had been studying with a, with a beautiful young couple, and a young man was just baptized into Christ. Juan, would you mind standing this morning? Here's our new brother in Christ. And that was just Friday. And as Don was preparing to baptize him, Don has been faithfully and, and, and humbly uh, studying with him. I think he's a pretty quick learner. Has it been a year? Is that what I heard? Yeah. But everything was set up for the wedding, so he came down the aisle, and here's all these pretty flowers, and he was like, is this for me? <laughs> Don was like, sure. <laughs> but what, a glory, what, what a beautiful thing to be able to witness the glory of the new birth and of salvation and a brother in Christ. So if you're ready to make that walk, we don't have the flowers, but you can come up anyway. Or maybe you want to talk to us more and say, can I just can I learn more about this? Then let us know. You can come up forward and let us know. Or if we can pray for you in any way. Or if you want to meet with a shepherd, you can go on the other side of this the wall in classroom one, and a shepherd and, and their spouse will meet with you there and visit and pray with you there in private. But make the right choice. As together we stand and sing.